Hello, welcome back. My name is Amina and this is our second episode in the series of Why Study Sport, where we look at um, the relationship between sport and society. Today's episode, we're going to be looking at gender relations in sport. So the two main global goals that we're going to talk about today is goal five, which is gender equality. And I have a global goals ball with me today. So it is goal five, so gender equality, and goal 10, reduced inequalities. So for today, what I'll be mainly talking about is um, gender, ways of thinking about gender, and how ideas and beliefs about gender impact people's experiences of sport. I'll be giving examples of elite athletes and how ideas about gender and society's assumptions of particular genders have impacted their experiences of sport. Um, I'll also, at the very end, I'll be talking about how uh, you can t take these ideas and put them into an education setting. So if you're an ed uh, a teacher or you're a coach, how you can make people start thinking about how their understandings of gender might impact their experiences of sport or how society's understandings of gender might impact people's experience of the sport. So what I would first say, um, while we're waiting for some people to join, is uh, grab yourself a piece of paper and draw yourself in the gym or draw yourself uh, exercising. So if you don't normally go to the gym, you don't normally um, go to a fitness center, draw yourself exercising. Um, and once you've done that, think about how your gender might have influenced your experience of that. So if you go to the gym, what do you normally do? Um, how would you vision yourself? So if you went outside of your body and you were looking down, what would you be doing in the gym? And think about how your gender impacts that. So I have a few examples here. I'm not going to show them just yet, but I'll talk about how through doing these activities as an interactive thing, you can th talk um, and teach people or your students about gender and it's um, influence in, in sport or in, in everyday life. But today, what I'm going to focus on is, again, goal five, which is gender equality and goal 10, which is reduced inequality. But before you go on to look at how you can take action on those goals, you have to start considering how, <coughs> what, what it means when we talk about equality um, and, or inequality and what and how that's related to equity or inequity. So often when we talk about equality, we talk about something that we're striving for um, and something that we want to see in sport. Uh, but equality is often equated to giving um, people giving people the same thing. Um, and I'm going to use the example of sport to talk about what the difference is between equality and equity. So I have a little picture here to show a clear example of that in cycling and I'll talk you through um, why it's important to understand that, that difference of equality and equity. So just bear with me while I get a picture up for you. So equality and equity are often seen as interchangeable, um, but I think this infographic is a good way of explaining and understanding what the difference is between e equity and equality. So if you just want to take a look at that and I can talk you through what we're seeing in the picture. So everyone here on the, in the top column refers to equality. Everyone is given a bike. And on the second column, we're looking at equity. Everyone is given a bike based off their own specific needs. So I'll sum up the difference in, of equity and equality using the example of cycling. So if we want everyone, we want everyone to have equality in cycling, the most obvious thing to do is give everyone a bike. But there's a problem with that. People have different needs and different requirements when it comes to 
the bike that they have. Um, so if we put that into context, we might think about um, everyone has a bike, but is everyone able to access it and use that resource that we've given them? So what might be not taken into consideration is um, where they live, whether they're, it's safe to go out and cycle. If um, they go out and cycle and they leave their bike on the side, is it safe to leave it there? Will it be there when um, they're gone? If they live in a rural area, is it safe to cycle on, on the road? Is there cycle lanes? Um, or is it dangerous for them um, to cycle around bends in their area? So they're just some things to think about. <laughs> and that's when we start thinking about equity. So how fair something is. Even though we give everyone access to something, how likely are they to access that? Um, and that's something that we consider in the context of any sport. So yes, we might have equal opportunities, but do we value everyone equally? Um, or does everyone have the same ability or opportunity to use that? Um, so there's just some things to think about when we're talking about equality and equity. But for anybody that's just joined, um, my name's Mina, and what we're talking about today specifically is gender relations in sport. So um, those are just some key ideas in relation to equality because we're looking at uh, gender equality and reduced inequality. But a good way to start or a good starting point when we're talking about gender is to think about ideology. Don't get afraid when you hear the word ideology. It's a sociological term, but I'll give you um, a basic definition that Coakley and Pike use to define what an ideology is. So they define an ideology as a web of ideas and beliefs that people use to give meaning to the world um, and to the, make sense of their experiences. But the key phrase there, that's still a lot of words, is a web of ideas and beliefs. So a way to think about it is think of ideologies like accents. So everyone has an accent, uh, but we usually aren't aware of our own accent especially when we're at home surrounded by people who have similar accents to us. And it's only when we take ourselves out of our normal environment. So let's say we go abroad and travel. I'm currently in Ireland. So if I go um, to Norway or Denmark, um, I might be exposed to other accents that I'm not familiar with. Um, and that's only when I start to realize generally or typically when I realise that other people have different accents. Um, and we can take that idea and that um, thinking and apply it to ideologies. So where we live, we're usually surrounded by people that think um, the same or similar to, to us. And um, we don't really realise that we have similar um, ways of thinking or that there are other ways of thinking until we take ourselves out of that bubble that we're usually in um, and are exposed to different ways of thinking. So if we take the exact same example that we did before, so if I go traveling um, to Denmark, instead of thinking about it in terms of accents, I might be exposed to different ways of thinking in Denmark that I'm not used to. You can do the same in terms of your work or your university. It's then when you might recognize that um, there are other ways of thinking about something. And that's often referred to in sociology as a cultural logic. So um, cultural logic is a common sense idea or belief about something. Um, so if we apply that to gender, a gender ideology is a common sense belief about um, gender. So ideas and beliefs about gender. So that's mainly what we're gonna talk about today, gender ideologies in sport. So um, to first start off, we need to think about defining and understanding um, how society sees gender and sex. So there are two really important points to start with. So what do we mean um, when we say sex and what do we mean when we say gender? Those two words are often used interchangeably, but they um, can often mean different things or well, slightly different things. So, um, when we talk about gender, how it's often talked about in sociology and um, is seen as in society is as a binary classification. So binary, what that really means is just one of two things. 
So um, when we talk about gender or we talk about um, when we talk about sex, we normally mean um, you're a man or a woman. And binary classification system means that if you are not a man, you must be a woman and vice versa. So if you're not a woman, you must be a man. Um, and that's a key idea behind a lot of gender ideologies that exist and that can be applied to sport. Um, so how do we define sex? Sex is often considered a binary organization based off biological traits. So based off biology. Um, so biological is traits associated with being a man or being a woman. So I'll say that again. Sex is often defined as um, biological traits that society associates with being a man or being a woman or being male or being female. Whereas gender is socially constructed. It's a socially constructed norm. And what I mean by a norm is um, what society considers normal. So in terms of gender um, uh, or socially constructed norms related to gender is what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man and what we expect men and women to behave on how they should be. <coughs> Let me see what I have here. Um, and those those two ideas, so sex and gender, are often our understandings of them are often based off the assumption uh, that heterosexuality is the norm. So gender relates to um, ideas about masculinity and femininity. So um, those ideas about masculinity and femininity are influenced by society, culture, norms, so what is expected um, by society as to be normal and by expectations put on men and women um, and gender is often related to personal identity. So I'll go back to the statement that I just said. So definitions of sex and gender are often based off the assumption that heterosexuality is the norm or is considered the normal. So anything outside of that is considered um, deviant behaviour and not within the norm. Um, so that idea dictates how women and men should behave. So stereotypes based off that assumption would mean that m women are nurturing, so characteristics um, that uh, women are nurturing, are mothers, are child bearers. On the flip side, for men, um, stereotype, gender stereotypes based off the assumption that heterosexuality is normal, um, is that men are aggressive, or men, yeah, men are aggressive, strong, um, the breadwinners are competitive, and um, how that affects um, us is it encourages people to behave a certain way, um, and based off uh, femininity, feminine characteristics and uh, masculine characteristics, and behave in a feminine way and a masculine way. So putting people into that binary classification saying that um, they have to be within that box of masculine or within that box of feminine um, to be defined as male or female. But the problem with that and what's problematic, often sociologists write about it, saying um, that when you have that classification, uh, if someone does not um, subscribe to those ideas of femininity and masculinity and don't fit into that box, they're often considered problematic in society or um, deviant, showing deviant behaviour, uh, which means that people are often excluded if they don't classify or if they don't um, fit into those boxes. So we, we often see that in terms of um, uh, LGBT community. Um, so if someone identifies as transgender where they don't fit into those boxes, they can find themselves being excluded. Um, yeah okay so what i'm going to um move on to in relation to those ideas and how you see that playing out in sport so ideas about gender and that binary classification so binary being um one of two so if you're not a man you're a woman and if you're not a woman you're a man 
um, how that plays out in sport and how we've seen it play out in sport is in terms of using testosterone as a way of classifying um, or labeling female athletes as women. So I'm going to take the case of Castor Semenya and Duce Chand, which are both um, athletes competing in um, the World Athletics Championships or uh, just athletics in general, in, in terms of sport. So testosterone um, has contributed to a lot of ideas about gender, about sex, but also about the body. So um, what I'm not going to do in this session is talk about how um, to validify or, ver or verify claims that say um, that are associated with testosterone and I know I'm a scientist but I'm not going to try verify those claims based off scientific studies or I'm um, not going to say what's the most appropriate way of uh, defining gender categories in sport but what I'm going to try introduce to you is um, that ideas gender idea ideologies related to testosterone um, can reaffirm or oh wait testosterone can reaffirm gender ideologies and um, can perpetuate ideas about femininity and masculinity so um, how I'm going to talk about specifically how testosterone has been used as a biological criteria to determine whether a female can participate in the female category um, so for anybody that's joined my name's Amina and we're talking about gender relations in sport so far, I've talked about what gender ideologies um, are, so their ideas and beliefs about gender. And right now, I'm going to introduce the uh, way ideologies or the way testosterone has perpetuated ideas about gender, ideas about sex and ideas about the body. <coughs> so Castor Semenya and Duce Chand are two... Um, key figures in athlete in in sport who have been subject subjected and negatively affected by um, sex testing and the use of testosterone to to as a biological criteria um, to label women as women in the female category so for anybody that doesn't know in athletics there are hyper androgenism regulations so their rules um, placed on female athletes to where they have to verify their gender to participate in the female category of um, their sport, so athletics. Um, and what that does in the current day is use testosterone to verify their sport before participating. And it, these rules or regulations dictate what is considered a normal level of natural testosterone in female athletes bodies and um, if it's out of bounds it this or if your levels the athletes levels of testosterone are higher than what is considered normal then these athletes are disqualified um, from the female category um, and the IFA or IAAF which is the um, International Association of Athletics Federations they claim that these regulations are not um, policing the male and female divide. So they're not um, separating or looking at the categories of whether someone is in the female category and male category. But what they're claiming is that um, these rules and regulations are um, creating a new category of ineligible um, female athletes within the female category. But what I think is important to consider is that there is no third category. So if an athlete is um, present, presents with uh, higher um, than normal levels of natural testosterone, so this is testosterone in their body that is higher than um, what is considered normal, they are being excluded from their sport and are, what they're told to do is lower their testosterone levels um, by undergoing medical intervention to, uh, to be able to compete in the female category. So they're either going to be excluded and can no longer compete in their sport 
or unless they undergo medical intervention to lower their testosterone, natural testosterone levels. What I think is important to think, think and point out here is that sport are, is telling athletes what is considered a normal level of testosterone in the body. And as I think many people are aware, the body is a very complex thing um, and uh, it's very difficult to create a standard especially um, experts, scientific experts have said that um, and reported the complexity of sexed bodies. So defining um, what we need to consider when we're thinking about gender um, and, or when we're thinking about sex. Um, so I, I'm going to specifically focus on the case of Duce Chant and talk about what, what has been considered for her case in terms of, oh wait, I should probably say that Duce Chant was um, pulled from her category on suspicion of having high levels of testosterone um, and was, no, was not allowed to compete in her category. In the case of Castor Semenya, she also was suspected of having high levels of natural testosterone and was taken out um, and was disqualified from competing in um, her sport. She was also, um, she also had her, a lot of her medals taken away from her because of this until the investigation of whether she had high levels of testosterone in her body um, was confirmed or denied uh, for her to compete in the, the games. <clears throat> so what's often criticized or these regulations are often criticized be, for being oversimplified. Um, and that was also done in the case of Castor or Duce Chan's court hearing in 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 court so she took it up um in court so she could compete in um she didn't want to undergo medical intervention she took it up in court to say that um they are natural levels of testosterone in her body and that she should still be allowed to compete what scientific experts urge the court to consider is the complexities of the body um but they rejected these claims and said it did not match with the binar the existing binary classification of the sex body. So um, if they are considering this the complexity of um, these categories or complexity of the body, we cannot have male and female categories, which is not what the court wants. Um, so what I think um, it's important to highlight as well is what's why why do we have these um gender tests for uh, athletes to compete so the idea behind it and the original reasoning behind introducing gender verification um tests in this sport is to protect um female sport from male intruders but it has since changed and the reasoning behind that has changed since 1968 um and now the belief and the reasoning for having these categories or these regulations, sorry, is to protect um, the sport from uh, masculine qualities that are inherently superior to female to female attributes. Um, so th there's an idea that um, masculine characteristics are superior to fem um, female. At Wait a second male qualities are inherently superior to female attributes and under all of that it's um there's an underlying idea there which is um the hegemic nature of these regulations so what that means is that um women are being considered a weaker sex and that these categories are there to protect the fairness of women's sport um, so if I talk about testosterone, testosterone is seen as a male hormone. It's, um, it's been attributed to the athletic success of men in sport. And if women show uh, the high levels of testosterone, it's considered that they have an athletic advantage over other females in their sport. So before going on to that and elaborating more on that, I think it's important to think about how um, these rules, so these gender tests 
have existed because it wasn't always we weren't always looking at testosterone as a way of testing um, someone's gender so initially gender verification in the female category was done through visual inspection so the very first one was in 1948 where um, women had to undergo visual inspection of female um, genitalia to verify women's sex but and it was also referred to as a nude parade so where they had to visually um, show um, uh, inspectors their genitalia but that was seen as very intrusive and the sporting bodies had to come up with another way that was less intrusive to verify um, a woman's um, or a female athlete's sex so what was then considered was a genetic assessment so for anybody that doesn't know that means they were considering our DNA in our DNA um, we have sex chromosomes that are considered to determine our sex so what that means is uh, in our DNA we would have XX for female and XY for male. You don't really need to understand that completely but just know that um, in our DNA there's two chromosomes that are being considered or uh, there's a chromosome that's responsible for sex and it will display XX for female and XY for male um, and that was being used for a very long time to verify a woman's sex um, and make them eligible to participate and compete in a female category. However, there is a problem with that because there's genetic conditions where a woman um, might have XY, which is considered a male hormone. However, their body doesn't um, develop into a male, it develops into a female. So um, those categories could not be used anymore. That there was problems with using um, these sex chromosomes to determine whether a, a female um, should compete in the female category or female athlete should compete in the female category. Um, so they needed to think of another way of um, testing whether a female athlete was uh, a female and could compete in this category. But what they kept finding uh, in terms of the genetic test was that there's so much genetic variation that contributes to um, sex or contributes to someone's um, gender. Um, so they kept getting problems and problems and then eventually what was what was done was um, hormonal testing was considered so testosterone was considered as a viable option um, but before that happened what was done in in the Olympics so the at the very start every single female that was inter female athlete that was interested in competing in the female category had to undergo this um, test but then um, what happened was that a select few were, were subject to um, undergo these tests so instead of making all females um, take this test to verify their gender what was then introduced is that only a select few would have to undergo this test so someone that was suspected of having um, or breaching this rule so what um, what often happened in there in because of this new um, rule that not everybody had to get tested is it led the way to discrimination so experts were trying to identify athletes who displayed male characteristics and this encouraged um, the idea of an ideal image of femininity if that makes sense so they were identifying um, athletes and pulling athletes out that displayed masculine qualities or masculine characteristics um, and this led to perpetuating the idea of um, femininity so athletes had to appear feminine um, and if they didn't they could be suspected of um, breaching or, or could be possibly disqualified from um, the female category because they might go undergo gender testing to verify their gender um, so that is a form of um, discrimination that was that started happening um, so testosterone was introduced at this point as a form of gender testing but now I, I'll go back to the idea that testosterone is a male hormone um, it's that's a common sense belief in society 
uh, that has been perpetuated, that testosterone is male hormone. However, scientists have um, reported constantly that testosterone is not exclusive to men. It's also present in, in women. Um, and I can tell you that as a scientist, that there's levels of um, testosterone uh, in the female brain as well as the male brain. Um, however, it's typically higher in men. Um, so that's what they started using as uh, a way of identifying female athletes or verifying female athletes um, and saying they can compete in the female category. <coughs> so something to think about um, why they were using testosterone for for this is because there was an idea that testosterone is associated with increased athletic performance. So why that um, was believed it was because athletic advantage has to do with the testosterone's association with increased um, muscle mass, physical strength. However, there wasn't an, there isn't a lot of evidence, consistent evidence that, to support the idea that testosterone um, or high levels of testosterone is associated with athletic performance. Um, but it continues to be to be used as um, a biological criteria to label women as women in the female sport. What I'm going to highlight as well, which I think is an important thing to consider when we are considering whether testosterone should be used as a biological criteria to label women and determine their eligibility to compete within the female category, is that testosterone has other purposes in sport. I mean, in sport. Testosterone has other functions within the body. So testosterone doesn't just um, lead to athletic, enhanced athletic performance or um, gives an athletic advantage. It's also responsible for physiological function in the body. So that includes bone development, liver metabolism. Um, so it's not just to do with um, male puberty and um, athletic or mus increased muscle mass, it has to do with bone development and um, liver metabolism as well. So why that's important is because, let's remember back to something I've said before, for, fem for women that are, are excluded because of high levels of natural testosterone, in order to be reconsidered to compete in their category, they have to undergo medical intervention to lower their levels of testosterone. And what's uh, problematic about that is that we um, know that testosterone has other roles in the body. So bone development, liver metabolism. And if we're undergoing, if athletes are undergoing interventions to lower the levels of testosterone in the body, how is that going to affect other functions um, that testosterone plays a role in? So how is that going to affect bone development, which is very important for athletes, um, liver development. Will that um, intervention affect their ability to perform and their overall health? Um, that hasn't been looked at in much detail. Um, and that's what has been uh, encouraged by scientific experts to consider when we're considering these regulations. But that still exists. So that idea that... Um, uh, well, that's, that these regulations still exist. So athletes are still being told that they have to lower their levels of uh, in natural or endogenous testosterone in order to compete. So what I want to talk about now is the ideology. So gender ideologies around that. So I said that testosterone contributes to ideas about the body, about sex and about gender. Um, what I've talked about there in terms of testosterone used as a biological criteria to protect the fairness of women's sport. What's important to highlight is we we aren't testing the male category. So what why is it that we are subjecting female bodies to undergo um, this testing to be eligible to fit within the female category? Um, and these regulations are these regulations telling female athletes what the ideal body should look like and um, 
that it's is it considered abnormal if they don't fit this ideal feminine body uh so it's determining what is considered a normal body or what's considered the norm for a female body and what's considered abnormal um but these ideas of testosterone um is has also contributed to uh, masculine masculinity and masculine ideologies so i said that Testosterone has been, been believed to be a male hormone um, and it has been used to justify certain levels of violence and aggression in men claiming that the behavior is innate. And um, what we often see is, uh, say, for example, in a sporting context, if we take boxing, boxing um, has been considered as a, a, a place for men to release the inner the beast which is what one of my um one of uh, a sociologist sports sociologist in nottingham trent university um discovered in his study so his name is christopher matthews and he looked at boxing and masculinity and one of the participants that he interviewed had said that boxing has been described as a legitimate way of um letting out the beast and releasing that natural inclination towards violence so they're just some, some things to consider in terms of uh how gender ideologies and ideas about masculinity and femininity influence people's experiences of sport so if you can remember at the very start of the session when i introduced the uh the topic for today which is gender relations I asked you to take a sheet of paper and draw uh, how you see yourselves in um, in the gym or what you would do if you were doing physical activity um, so if you have that piece of paper I want you to think about how gender influences uh, your experience or um, influences your experience in the gym influences your experience of physical activity and what you can do a lot of the time to introduce this topic of gender ideology is get students to draw themselves and if initially they say that gender does not influence their experience in the gym or does not influence their experience of fitness have a look at what they've drawn so i i have terrible drawing skills so um please excuse my terrible drawing but i did a, drew a few examples because i've done this with my students in um nottingham and this is something similar to what they've drawn before which is um so i'll just show you what i have so here i i have a guy who's drawn muscles and abs um, and this is how he sees himself when he's in the gym the next one i have here is a girl um who's gone out running um so she drew herself doing some cardio exercises the next one i have here is a guy who is doing some weight lifting weights above his head focusing on his upper body and the last one i have here is a little drawing of a girl doing some pilates so focusing on abs and we have some weights here in the corner um and initially you mightn't think gender has any role to play in terms of um how you see yourself in the gym but what we often see is that some of these pictures are related to gender stereotypes so why is it that we do certain exercises um does it have any does it involve any um way that is it influenced by ways we think about gender um and what is considered feminine and masculine so often in terms of the gym setting um so the gym and place can have a role to play in perpetuating these um, gender stereotypes so we what i often see in my classes that is that girls will draw themselves doing um uh, cardio exercises because often in society women are encouraged to lose weight um to grow their glutes and focus on on lower body exercises whereas men um sorry i look for a, ma um, a male one 
is to build upper body strength to show the masculine characteristics of strength and aggression um you can even see that in terms of men um grunting in uh the gym to, to show their masculinity so a demonstration of masculine um characteristics obviously this is isn't um everybody so you often see i myself when i go to the gym i focus on on upper body but in general the norms and what's typically seen is certain characteristics and certain behavior patterns which relate to ideas about gender so there's something that you can um, encourage people to do in um in your session so if you're a coach you can start getting people to think about how gender might expect uh, influence their experience in sport um and in terms of competitive sport how we're influenced um about gender ideologies in society um and how that might impact our experiences in sport so they're just some things to think about what i'm going to do at the end of this session is uh leave a link to some paper uh and some articles in the guardian that talk about testosterone and how it has been considered inaccurately as a male hormone and how it's affected some athletes in their sport so again um thank you for listening my name's amina we were talking about the relationship between sport and society, particularly gender relations in sport. What I'm going to do in next session is focus on racism in sport. So how racial ideologies influence and impact people's experiences of sport. So today's session looked at goal five, uh, gender equality and goal 10, reduced inequality. So in the next session, we'll be focusing on reduced inequalities as well but specifically about ideas about race and gender. So thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next Thursday for another session. Bye.